All right, what's going on guys? Harry with the Rideshare Guy here, and we're here with our monthly live Q&A session. And today's session is gonna be focused all on taxes, rideshare taxes. We'll be going over quite a few different things, answering all your live questions, just like we usually do. Um, so if you guys are watching live on YouTube right now, thank you for joining. If you're watching a replay later, we'll actually have a blog post for this one, and you can go ahead and see all that on our website. We'll leave a link in the show notes and all that good stuff. So um, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce uh, today's guest. We actually have from Intuit TurboTax. So her name is Jenny Bouchong. Did I say that right, Jenny? That's correct. Thank you. Hello. Awesome. Thank well, you for you having for, me. <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining. We're looking forward to uh, getting a lot of questions answered. And uh, so Jenny's actually a tax analyst at Intuit TurboTax, and she has a JD and a master's in taxation, which uh, I think I already mentioned to you, Jenny, but that sounds pretty impressive to me. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. So thanks for joining. And um, yeah, we'll go ahead. It looks like uh, I'm going to let a few people filter in right now, but it looks like we're going, we're streaming live right now. So for everyone who's joining us, thank you very much. And uh, like I said, we actually do these live sessions every single month. Uh, this month, we're actually doing it a little bit early. Technically, this is our April live session, but we did it a few days early just because uh, tax the tax deadline is coming up. So I guess my first question for our audience, I'm curious to know who's filed their taxes so far. Um, did you guys use a CPA? Did you guys use TurboTax, a, a program like that? Or uh, are you waiting uh, last minute like I know probably a lot of our audiences? So uh, Jenny, have you actually filed your taxes yet? I have not. I'm one of those procrastinators who waits till the very last minute. All right. Awesome. So I actually I don't recommend it, but <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's how a lot of people are. They sort of recommend it. Everybody knows they need to get it done early, but uh, it's pretty tough uh, or it's pretty easy, I guess I would say, to wait till the last minute. So we've got a few people jumping in here. We've got Jerry um, who says not yet, but he will be using TurboTax. So that's awesome. Uh, user of driver says I use a CPA. Vanessa F says not yet. Harold uh, from User, I actually met him for lunch the other day. Thanks for joining, Harold. And he says that he hasn't uh, done his taxes yet either. And your driver, Mike, says that he uh, is using a CPA. So just to give you a little uh, a little background right there, and we actually do have um, our first uh, comment right here from Kevin, an extension and great accountant works fine. So I guess that's the other option, right, Jenny? You can always do an extension. <laughs> right, if you have to get your books in order. Or, or if, if your, your CPA, CPA is busy and is recommending, recommending that that you file an extension, go ahead and do that now. If you it gives you just gives you some, a breather in some space to get everything ready to go. Yeah, definitely. So there's no penalties or anything like that for filing an extension, right? Because I've actually never done it, but I definitely have filed my taxes like right at the last minute. I never really thought about that. No, there's no actual penalty, but there's an interest. Um, so you get charged interest for not paying what you would have owed on April 15th. So if you're waiting, you're paying, um, even you're not paying the full amount that's owed on April 15th, by April 15th, you will have to pay interest on that amount, but there's no other. Cool. That's good to know. So we've got a few people uh, filtering in now. So if you guys are just joining right now, thank you for coming on to our monthly YouTube live today. We're actually going to focus all about taxes. And I know this is a topic that we've been getting a lot of emails about. We've got some good resources on the site and we've actually got some good articles. We've worked with the uh, TurboTax and QuickBooks self-employed team over at Intuit to actually help you guys actually file your taxes, to track your expenses and all that stuff uh, that we're going to get into today. So if you do have questions around taxes, definitely start Start asking them right now. We'll go ahead and try to get to as many as possible. Right now, I'm actually, you know, I've introduced Jenny from Intuit TurboTax's team, and she's our tax expert for today. So you guys don't have to listen to me pretend like I know what I'm talking about taxes. We actually have an expert who uh, will be able to answer almost all of your questions. And I do want to read off a couple. Uh, we do have a little disclaimer because obviously we can't uh, give personal tax advice right now. So what we're basically doing is this is kind of for informational purposes only, and we're going to apply, you know, so this can't obviously apply to your personal situation. If you do have more complex tax questions or situations, you can obviously go and buy the software, ask them directly for your own personalized advice or use a CPA. Does that sound about right, Jenny, for that disclaimer? Right, right. 
will provide the general what what would apply to most people. But if you have a complex, more complex situation that wasn't mentioned, then you should probably talk to your CPA. I basically I say just take what I'm saying uh, and don't sue me, please. <laughs> <laughs> But um, but yeah, so that sounds good. So we're going to go over some of these top questions right now. So feel free to go ahead and uh, start asking your questions in the comments. We'll try to get to as many as possible. And I think that I went over everything we needed to. We'll uh, you know so we got that disclaimer in there. We're going to go over it right now. I'm going to quickly go over some of the basics of the taxes. So if you guys are just filing for the first time or just really at a high level, and then we'll get into that live Q and A. I definitely want to mention to make sure you stay tuned to the end too because today we've got some really cool prizes. We've got three copies of TurboTax Self-Employed. So if you've waited to the last minute, you'll actually be able to win a free copy and we'll be picking out from our commenters. So unfortunately, if you're watching at a later date, um, you won't be able to win right now. Although um, if you're watching live, we'll actually pick out a few winners right at the end. So, um, and I believe it's at a $95 around there, $100 value. So definitely a good uh, giveaway today. And um, you know, at a high level, obviously drivers, you know, the unique thing about driving for Uber and Lyft is that you do receive a 1099 as opposed to other jobs where you're going to get a W-2 or be an actual employee. You're an independent contractor with Uber and Lyft, which basically just means you have a little more tax responsibility when you get that 1099. You do need to file a Schedule C and you will get um, a 1099-K and potentially a 1099 MISC from Uber and Lyft. And so there is just that little extra work, those little extra reporting requirements and of course, the big thing that we care about too is on the deduction, deduction side, there are more things that you get to deduct. So I mean, Jenny, as far as the basics of driving for Uber and Lyft, is there anything else that drivers should know from a really high level point of view? Um, they should be aware that to track all of their, from their statements, they need to be looking at um, all of their fees. So if they have operational fees through Uber and Lyft, that should be separated out and they definitely can deduct those. And they have um, whatever snacks and provide like chargers for their, their riders, anything like that can be deducted. Cool. Awesome. So um, let's start getting into some of these questions. We actually had a few drivers send us questions. We asked for questions ahead of time. And uh, one of the first ones that I wanted to ask you, and this comes up, I think probably the most common question we get is from drivers. And this one comes in um, from Amy. She says, I received my 1099 from Uber uh, or Lyft that overstated my earnings. They included their 25% commission cut. Um, and the booking fee for riders. So why do I have to pay taxes on Uber's uh, earnings and fees that I did not receive? You actually won't be paying taxes on that. You take, they gave you the gross, which mm -hmm. means is the total amount that you earned, and then you have to subtract it out manually on your own Schedule C. So the fees and commissions that you paid to Uber, that 25%, that you would subtract out. And then you would also be able to deduct um, you would also be able to deduct any subscription uh, device fees or fuel gas card fees, those types of things that you might, that you are on your statement, you would also deduct those on your tax return. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I mean, I think that for a lot of drivers, you know, you're pretty aware of how much you're making as a driver. So when you come in and you see that 1099 and it's reporting, you know, let's say $50,000 and you only made 30 or 40,000, that's a pretty big discrepancy. So I do hope that most drivers are catching that. But I mean, if you basically, it sounds like if you basically use that numbers from your 1099 without looking at uh, the extra fees, you could actually easily be overpaying, right? If you're not careful. Right, so you should enter the 1099K um, and the 1099 MISC as the gross amount that they've entered there. And don't worry about it. You're going to subtract the deductions and the commissions and the fees that you're paying separately. So when you're filing your taxes, enter the gross amount exactly as it is on your official IRS forms. Perfect. But you awesome. should have a document of the actual of the expenses broken out. So if you look at your tax summary from Uber or Lyft, see what those fees were and the commissions that you paid and deduct those. Yeah, and that's a good point because Uber and Lyft do provide all of that information as far as the fees on your tax summary. So if you're a driver, you can actually go to your partners.uber.com dashboard and that's where you can log in and they have a tax section where you can look at your 1099s. You can also look at, look at your tax summary and then the same exact thing uh, with Lyft. And I guess my other question too, Jenny, I mean, I, I believe this rule, they call themselves or Uber and Lyft call themselves like a third-party payment processor, right? Is that is that the right term? 
term, or is that that's why they're reporting reporting this gross uh, amount that I guess like the total amount they're processing. That doesn't really affect me as a driver, though, right? It's just the way they do it. Right. So that shows up on your 1099K as a total amount, and you report that, but you are tracking your expenses and your fees separately. So it doesn't mean that you're going to be taxed on the full amount that's on the 1099 MISC or the 1099K. Right. Got it. Okay, perfect. So, um, you know, along those lines, you know, on that tax summary, uh, you know, Uber does provide. So, for example, Uber, I believe, provides all your on trip miles. Lyft provides. So that's when you're with a passenger. Lyft actually provides mile when you have mileage when you have the app on. Um, and so for drivers, you know, they obviously are looking at that as a potential source for deduction. So, I mean, as far as what miles they can deduct, um, is there any hard and fast rules right there? Is it a gray area? What, what's your advice uh, as far as for drivers looking to deduct their mileage and I guess potentially maximize that deduction, right? Because it reduces their taxable earnings. Right, right. So if you have a home office mm -hmm. that's exclusively used for managing and doing administrative tasks and bookkeeping for your Uber business and that's all that it's used for and you use it regularly, then you are able to deduct um, when you from the, the time you leave the, your home to when you pick up your first ride. Gotcha. So it's okay. important to always be tracking because normally commuting miles are not deductible, right? Gotcha. So if you don't have a home office, your home driving from your first your home to your first rider is not deductible. Yeah. So you so, should, oh, sorry. Keep going. No, go ahead. No, because I think that makes a lot of sense, and that's sort of one area of confusion. And I know we've actually gotten a lot of different answers from this, depending on the CPA or the tax professional or just the Uber driver who thinks he knows he's a tax professional saying that they are or aren't. Um, but I mean, I've never heard that home office aspect. That actually makes a lot of sense, because if commuting miles aren't deductible um, you know, normally, but you have a home office where you kind of go and reconcile all your Uber statements and things like that, which I'm sure a lot of drivers do, then when they go and drive to that first pickup, it's not technically commuting anymore. That's what it sounds like, right? Right, because you have to have a regular and principal place of business. So if you don't have one because you don't necessarily work on your out of your home or the home off or the place in your home, let's say is your dining room table, that's not going to be exclusive use. So you would not be able to duct from when you leave your home to your first ride. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So that was a great question we got from Dave, and it looks like a few other people um, are asking that, Nancy, in the comments. And um, I mean, I guess sort of a natural transition there, too, as far as, you know, because QuickBooks self-employed does allow you to track mileage. I mean, using one of these mileage trackers, um, you know, I'm assuming that uh, you probably like QuickBooks self-employed a lot, but, uh, you know, for these drivers that are tracking their mileage, I mean, is that the best way to do it, uh, use this mileage tracker? Because Lyft and Uber don't provide sort of the full picture of all the deductible miles, it sounds like, potentially, right? Right. So if you wanted to capture all of your miles, I would say, and because you, when you file your Schedule C, driving for either Uber or Lyft can be considered one business. So gotcha. you don't really need to be looking at separate apps. You could have QBSC's app, one app to track both your Lyft miles and your Uber miles at the same time. So you're only looking at um, have to dissect one one app and we'll carve it out and you should make notes as well to say well What was the business purpose of driving from point A to point B? Was it did you have a passenger in the car? Was it for gas? Was it to get your car wash things like that? So you can definitely um, you should make notes on a at least weekly basis to to delineate the business purpose of the mileage yeah, that totally makes sense, too, because, I mean, that's the other thing. You know, in our audience, I know we just surveyed uh, all of our drivers, and actually 75% of them are doing Uber and Lyft, right? So that definitely complicates things if you're trying to use the mileage from Uber and Lyft. It seems that it would be a lot easier to just use one mileage tracking app, uh, like a QuickBooks self-employed, because then that way you can really start it when you're leaving your house. And, I mean, I guess the same rules sort of apply at the end of the night, too, right, when you're coming back home. Correct. 
Okay, cool. Um, so that's definitely definitely helpful. So thank you guys for uh, asking those questions. Keep uh, keep definitely keep the questions coming in. Uh, if you guys are just joining now, we've got uh, Jenny Bouchong from Intuit TurboTax team, and she's here to answer all of your questions. Like we mentioned earlier, this is for informational purposes only. Uh, if you guys have a little more complex tax situation, you'll have to go and sort of see a CPA or someone who can handle that. And uh, you know, one other thing that comes up a lot with the mileage uh, situation is for people who at the end of the year say, oh crap, I actually didn't use a mileage tracker. I will use one next year. But for this year, what do I do, right, if I'm a driver right now trying to file my taxes for last year, basically, right? If I didn't really tr keep track of all my ride sharing miles, can I only use what Uber supplied me? Or is there a potential workaround? Or is this something I need to talk to a CPA? What do you think for that type of situation, Jenny? Um, I think the Uber and Lyft, what they've provided for you in the tax summary is the conservative approach. So you do have documentation. The IRS requires proof. So if you have receipts and um, some written record, which um, the statements on the tax summary by Uber and Lyft do qualify for that, um, you can go back and look in your notes. Let's say you have a calendar. Maybe you don't have very specifics on the mileage, but if you could recreate it from your calendar or if you could recreate it for even a month and say if that's a representative sample and you would have to prove that it was a representative sample, then you can extrapolate that month for across the year or however six months, say you were working for Uber or Lyft in the past year, you could do it that way. Okay, so that's but good. You would have to have some sort of substantiation. Mm -hmm. So that's good to know because if I'm a driver and I didn't do any of that, I can sort of use that Uber and Lyft uh, data as kind of a baseline or the most conservative option. But if I'm able to go back and even create one month or something like that and really substantiate all of that and my driving habits, you know, maybe I have receipts that I can back some of it up with um, or some type of substantiation, I can actually sort of add those additional miles still. I'm not completely out of luck. Right, right. So if you could substantiate, say you only worked in the past six months on the weekends and you can prove that, let's say for this, for the, for the last month of, in December 2016, let's say I drove eight hours a day for both weekend days and you could track like how many rides you picked up, things like that. And you could substantiate that this is what I did for the past year or six months that I did, that I was using ride sharing, then you could use that as to extrapolate. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And you know, we are getting a couple questions coming in about the uh, home office deduction because I think that for a lot of drivers, they're wondering, I mean, you don't necessarily need to uh, own a house or does it matter whether you own or rent or is it just if you have that exclusive place where you're operating out of your home? You do not have to own the home. You can rent the home, but the space needs to be exclusive use and regular use. I think the exclusivity part is the hardest it's the hardest to prove. Gotcha. I mean, so I guess as, if I'm a driver, even if I'm using one room basically just for that, um, it sort of has to be that exclusive nature. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, as far as the actual, you know, because there are these times and, you know, we could probably get into a lot of specifics. You know, Uber has some features that they're now enabling for drivers, like a destination filter that allows you to set a destination on your way home. And you may not necessarily get a ride, but you're still on the app. I mean, is, does that sort of fall into a gray area or can drivers try to take advantage of those new features that Uber is releasing to try and, you know, to now deduct those miles, for example? I would consider that a gray area. I think if you had the app on and made sure that you were available and willing to take it, I would think on, but if you had the home office, I would say, yeah, then it, then it might be considered um, commuting otherwise if you, if you turn the app off. I think whether you have the app on or off and being willing to accept, accept rides would be would determine whether or not the mileage was deductible. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, we've got a question coming in right here from Jay Crowder. He says, can you please lay out all the applicable expenses a rideshare driver can use for deductions? Um, and I mean, I guess the besides the 54 or whatever it is cents per mile, I mean, I guess that's the first thing as far as drivers, right? Because they're obviously looking to kind of maximize those deductions. I mean, I guess the first thing we should maybe take one step back and ask about that standard mileage deduction versus the actual expense expenses, right? For drivers, I mean, what do they need to know about that? So for the first year that you're driving and you use a car for business, if you don't use the standard mileage rate, you mm -hmm. will not be able to use that 54 cents or whatever the applicable um, standard 
rate is in the future okay. for that vehicle. So if you want to ever take advantage of that for your vehicle, then I would take it the first year you start using it. And okay. then in the following years, if you if it turns out that actual expenses um, are actually better, give you a greater deduction, then you can switch for that tax year to using actual expenses. Gotcha. Okay, cool. And then, I mean, I guess as far as what the uh, standard mileage uh, covers, what type of stuff does it cover for those drivers? So that would include your um, depreciation. So mm -hmm. you don't have to carve that out separately. And it really, you don't get to claim anything like um, oil changes or um, it's like car washes, things like that would not be included. Okay. So, I mean, basically anything, um, you know, so I guess for drivers that are looking for sort of these additional uh, deductions on top of their vehicle expenses, right? Obviously they can't, if they're taking the standard mileage, they can't deduct oil changes and maintenance and stuff like that on their car. Okay. Um, what about for some of those other things that they might use as a driver, right? If they have like little gadgets that they're, you know, if they're providing phone chargers or if they're starting to right. look deductions and things like that. Are there things that drivers should, you know, in your experience, like dealing with these drivers, are there things that are pretty common to a rideshare driver that they can deduct that on top of that standard mileage rate? Um, things like air fresheners or um, things like business cards, um, any snacks that they provide, water, if they have water in the car, those types of things would also be deductible. Okay, cool. Awesome. So uh, let's see. I think we've got a few more questions coming in right here. Uh, Scott says um, he's asking about mileage tracking apps. Yeah, so there's actually a whole list of mileage tracking apps. Um, we've, we've been talking about QuickBooks Self-Employed. We'll leave a link to that. Um, and then uh, we also see um okay so i guess as far as uh car washes a couple drivers have questions on car washes is that one that is included in the standard mileage because i mean i think that in the past we've seen that some people have said you can uh, deduct it on top since it's sort of like for the presentation of your vehicle or is that a, a gray area too <laughs> um it's an actual expense so okay. if you, yeah, so you wouldn't be able to deduct it on top of the standard. Okay. Um, all right. So let's see. We've also got some questions here from uh, Wayne, I guess, looking forward for drivers who are, uh, who have, you know, been going through this whole process. I mean, once they file their taxes and going forward, what about uh, estimated or quarterly payments? Do drivers need to worry about this or is this something they need to be tracking? Um, there is, you should be making estimated payments quarterly. That's important because you don't want to have an, um, an underpayment penalty at the end of the year, which it's a low penalty. It's a uh, half a percentage point, but it does add up. You don't want it, any of it taking away from your, your, your potential refunds. Um, so if you don't make estimated payments, then you basically owe all the tax at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And if you have a cash flow issue, um, then you probably would have to ask for uh, like a payment plan through the IRS. So it's not it's not awful, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely better to make estimated payments throughout the year. And you can do that using different apps. So there are different apps like Taxcaster out there. So you can enter your um, filing status, your estimated income, and any potential deductions that you foresee, and then we can estimate for you what you would potentially owe at the end of the year. And you could divide that by four and send in your estimated quarterly payments pretty easily that way. Okay, cool. So um, we have uh, a couple questions coming in that are asking about, uh, so Dana's here is asking about business and, pers and personal excuse me, percentage, because I know there's some rules around, you know, these deductions, right, that you have to allocate how much you're using business and personal. And she's saying that QuickBooks Self-Employed can divide expenses between business and personal as a percentage for things like my monthly car payment. Uh, do I determine the percentage of the business expense, you know, based on those miles driven for Uber and Lyft? Or when does that uh, come into play? Um, you would, you should do it if depending on if you're using for personal purposes, you would allocate, that would be for actual expenses. So if you're taking your car 
and saying if you're not tracking the mileage separately just to take the standard deduction you would say oh well this is my the cost of my lease payment for my car and this is the amount that i used for personal versus business Mm -hmm. gotcha yeah that makes sense and i mean i know that we saw i saw a couple drivers that are on an exchange lease and a lyft express drive so for those drivers um that are asking about that i mean as far as their uh can they still claim a standard mileage deduction or do they have to do something different um, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? For drivers that are on a Lyft, ex or, sorry, a Lyft Express drive or an Uber exchange lease, um, can they use standard mileage or do they have to do something a little different? They can use standard mileage. They just need to be able to track um, what their personal versus business use is. So if they use that one vehicle while they're not driving for when they do not have the app on and when they're not driving for the ride sharing program, then they need to subtract that out. Gotcha. Okay. And then, you know, I have heard from some drivers that, for example, might live in Sacramento. So we have a, a driver right here, Jay Crowder. He says, if I live in Sacramento and drive to San Francisco and stay in an Airbnb, can I deduct that Airbnb uh, rental expense? And, you know, this is actually a situation that's somewhat common in a lot of the bigger cities, especially Bay Area, where drivers can find that they're making so much more money driving in San Francisco versus Sacramento. You know, they might go and rent an Airbnb for the weekend or share a hotel room or something like that with other drivers. Are those expenses for hotel rooms or Airbnb or whatever it might be deductible? I wouldn't think that they are deductible. There is the principal place of business. If they are always commuting from Sacramento to San Francisco, mm -hmm. then the principal place of business is really in San Francisco. And they don't have, um, and they are maintaining a separate they're not really maintaining a separate dwelling there. They're, I mean, it's convenient for them, but it's not necessarily um, a required expense because commuting with the, the distance is, is that's just happens to be where they're working that day. Gotcha. So, so I mean, just like if I am working, let's say, so if I decide to live 40 miles from work, I can't deduct that as a, yeah, I can't deduct. I can't decide, oh, I'm going to stay closer to work and therefore I can deduct that rental. Okay, so but I guess for those drivers who do drive, you know, maybe a few days a week in Sacramento and then a few days a week in San Francisco, then that might be something that they could look into. Right. Okay, gotcha. Um, okay, so I guess as far as, you know, we, I also had a question come in from Jerry. He was asking again about uh, these leasing the vehicles. I guess I lied to you. I, I told you that I didn't think that many drivers are leasing and renting vehicles, or maybe uh, more than I expected. Um, so can you include the lease amount, the insurance, uh, and the maintenance on it, right? Some of the things that you have to pay, or is it just uh, you can still do that, uh, that mileage, right, and claim the mileage, not the lease amount? If it's a bona fide lease, you can. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. And then, uh, you know, I also saw this question come in from Vanessa F. And she asked, are massages allowed as a write-off expense for drivers that drive more than part-time in any category? Massages are kind of a gray area, I would think. I, um, they'd have to be, deductible expenses are those that are ordinary and necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you would have to prove maybe a medical condition of some sort that would require specific, something specific like a massage rather than regularly, say, stepping out of your car and stretching or doing things on your own. But yeah, they need to be, yeah, they need to be necessary. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, I think that makes sense. I mean, I know for drivers, they're sort of always looking for these additional deductions uh, that they can have. And I mean, it is, you know, kind of a legitimate concern maybe for drivers who are spending, you know, eight to 12 hours in their car, right? They get out and they're all kind of sore and maybe they really like having massage, but it sounds like if it isn't uh, medically necessary, it might be sort of a gray area for them to try and deduct that. Right. If it becomes common and accepted in the industry, I guess there's an argument toward the IRS for that. But yeah, I would consider it a gray area. Okay, that's good. And I mean, but it does sound like if you're able to get a doctor or uh, someone that's licensed to basically write you, I don't know if they write a prescription or what, but something in official writing, then it could become a deductible. Yeah, I would think so. I think that would be a provide you with a stronger argument for for deducting those expenses. 
Okay, cool. Awesome. Uh, yeah, because we've got a lot of, uh, I think that uh, really hit with a lot of people. Uh, Forrest Tang says, my back, legs, heels, um, and butt are killing him today. So he wants to really figure out a way to deduct those massages. <laughs> If there are items such that are ergonomic, let's say he could get a different, like a steering wheel, some sort of seat adjustment, something to add there, those could be deductible. Oh, okay. That's so small things like that. But um, I would say, yeah, regular massages is, is, is pushing it a little bit. Gotcha. Because I mean, there's definitely extras like that. You know, we just wrote an article uh, all about uh, basically riders puking in the back of your car and kind of the advice that one of our writers, uh, or one of our writers uh, gave was, you know, that he uses, uh, what do you call them, floor mats and then also seat covers and protectors and things like that so that he's able to sort of quickly hose off all that puke and get back on the road. So, I mean, it sounds like those things could be deductible then. Um, yeah, I guess there's a potential for it, but it's definitely one of those things where you'd want to make sure that it's, it's common and, and necessary. Okay, gotcha. Um, so, I mean, are there any main deductions outside? I guess for Uber drivers, obviously, they're looking to maximize their mileage deduction. Are there any main deductions sort of outside of, um, you know, mileage, I guess, that drivers should be really be looking for? Um, I can't think of anything that are big. I think the act, the standard mileage rate is actually pretty generous and would actually benefit most people. Um, it saves you from having to to track a lot of and save receipts for a lot of the actual expenses. So I think for the majority of people who if they drive full time for one of these ride sharing services, they would benefit the most from a standard, the standard mileage rate. Gotcha. Okay. And so, I mean, I do know that, you know, we do, we did survey our audience and I know that a lot of drivers out there actually own their cars. So for those, so Robert asked, uh, what about the, uh, the loan, right? So if you get a loan um, to actually buy your car, is that deductible on top of mileage or is that included in that standard mileage? Um, that's, I think, I believe that is part of actual expenses. So that, um, that you would, you should, if you, if you took the standard rate, it would be included in that. But if you wanted to take actual expenses, that would, you would carve out um, your, your payments, your interest payments too for the loan. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, so that makes sense. And then, I mean, I guess, uh, let's see, we've got some other questions coming in. We'll go, so just so you guys, if you guys are just joining right now, uh, we've got Jenny Bouchon from uh, Intuit TurboTax, and we're closing in on the session. We'll probably ask a few more questions here. We've also got Christian in the comments if you guys are watching live. And um, we'll go ahead and we're, stay tuned to the end because we're actually going to give away uh, three copies of TurboTax Self-Employed. And then I guess while we were talking, Jenny, I also thought of one more thing. And it looks like we've got a comment right here from Gilbert Martinez. Uh, what about cell phone expenses? Because I know cell phones are probably the big thing for drivers, right? I mean, they're, you know, what we tell drivers after your kind of car, um, you're really your cell phone is kind of your, like your second most important tool. Is there anything that they can deduct there? Yeah, if you can somehow separate out your personal versus your business. So again, I think this is one of those areas where if you could look at a statement and then somehow allocate, see what your percentage business use is, say let's from 10 o'clock to, to 1 o'clock p.m., you are only accepting calls for business, you're only doing business activities on your phone. So that's a that's a portion of the day, right? So if you can track it and then extrapolate that for the week and then the month, and of, then you can decide um, you can prorate that for the year and subtract a portion of it. But if you don't have an exclusive business phone, then you can't sub deduct 100%. Got if it. you use um, one of those device subscription services, then there that should be on your tax summary from, the, from Lyft or Uber, and you can deduct that. Okay, cool. So, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I know what a lot of drivers are potentially worried about is like that they're going to have to track everything every single day of the week and the year. But it sounds like in a lot of cases, they can really just track it for a finite period of time and then apply that, you know, that's representative and then apply that to the whole year. Right, right. So let's say Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, you do it from 10 to 2. So you just track it for a week at a time. I would try to do it very detailed for a week. And then um, if that's your usual course, then that is enough to extrapolate further. You don't have to necessarily um, take very, very detailed notes on a daily basis. 
Gotcha. So this is a good question I see right here from Andy Griffin. Uh, they're asking, so there appears to be a distinct difference between the standard mileage deduction and going itemized, or I guess we call it actual expenses method. Are there any pros or cons of making either choice? I know you mentioned that you if you want to elect, if you ever want to take the standard mileage rate in the future, you have to elect it in that first year. Are there any pros and cons there as far as making that decision? Um, I think one of the issues you should consider is what type of vehicle you have. So maybe if you have um, electric vehicle versus an SUV, um, a gas guzzling vehicle, then um, you might want to take um, the actual versus instead of the instead of the standard. Um, if you anticipate more repairs that year, for instance, then um, you would take the the actual instead of the standard. But most of the time for 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 people who are driving full time for Uber or Lyft, the standard seems to work out better. But you should definitely try it both ways. Gotcha. And I mean, I'm assuming so. Like, will an app like QuickBooks Self Employed you can actually track all that and then compare when you're doing your taxes, right? Because I mean, I've used Tur I use TurboTax, right? And so I'm pretty sure that there's a section, right, where it asks you to uh, input like your uh, actual expenses and then it compares what's going to give you the bigger deduction, right? Right, right. So you are able to enter all of your actual expenses and then at the very end, they'll sort of do a comparison and say which will give you the biggest deduction. Okay, so that's good to know. You don't need to make that decision at the beginning of the year. You can kind of wait till your, I guess, the next year and wait until you do your taxes and see what's, what's going to give you the better offer and sort of go that way. And I think you're right. We actually have a comment coming in here from Alex who says maybe uh, the standard mileage tends to make sense for fuel efficient vehicles since you can deduct, you know, more, uh, more of that. And, you know, we actually just calculated in one of our articles sort of the cost of operating a vehicle and what we were finding for a lot of these Priuses. Um, it's like 20 to 30 cents a mile to actually operate, yet you get to deduct whatever it is, 53.5%. this year. I always get the number wrong because I think they're, they change it by like a half a cent every year, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and so I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, definitely it sounds like, but if you're in one of those bigger vehicles or something that's more gas puzzling or needs more repairs, then that actual expense method might be better. But I guess I like your advice best is just to stay, you know, track it all anyways, and then at the end of the year, you can make that decision, right? Right. So if you have like a simple app where you can use, then there's no reason why you shouldn't track both at the same time. Gotcha. And you know, one other thing that I was wondering about that I think I saw a question come in um, was as far as the uh, miles, you know, full time drivers are putting like a 1000 miles a week on their car. And I guess if there's a certain case where drivers are actually able to deduct more, you know, like kind of take enough deductions where they're almost reporting zero in income or getting very low in income. Are there any problems with doing that? Or should drivers really be trying to maximize their deductions to offset as much income as they possible as possible or anything like that? You should definitely try to maximize your deductions. Um, if it is you, the only the only worry would be if you were not truly operating a business. Mm -hmm. So if it was a hobby instead of a business, then you would run into run into issues. But if they were, they can prove that they're tr they're really trying to make money, and there it's a for they have a for profit motive, then they can it, it's fine if they end up with a loss at the end of the year. So they should always maximize their deductions. Okay, so that's interesting. I guess as you know, because I, I know some drivers have emailed us asking about that, and it sounds like if you sort of have that for-profit motive, which obviously I think driving for Uber and Lyft is pretty obvious, falls into that category. Um, they can actually try to maximize their deductions as much as possible, and then potentially pay less in taxes, right? Right, right. And you, the for-profit motive is sort of presumptive. The so you're right. So of course, if you are taking your time, extra time in the evenings and all your weekends to drive for a ride-sharing company, you definitely are doing this to make money. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, definitely uh, track everything. And as long as you can substantiate it with your records, again, an, an app is great for that. Then yeah, don't don't have any worries about about having a loss at the end of the year. Gotcha. So, I mean, it sounds like uh, it's important to track a lot of this, document a lot of this, um, and just basically be able to prove, you know, if you are taking these deductions, be able to prove it, right? Correct. And you should keep these records for at least three years, just okay. in case the IRS has a question about it, then um, you could you could bring it up, bring up your paperwork and on the computer, the computer is fine, and show them that this is how I, it, I arrived at the number and it's fine.
Gotcha. Yeah. And I mean, I know that you can take notes and things like that in the QuickBooks self-employed app. So definitely uh, there's some good tools out there that can help you uh, with all of that. So um, if you guys are just joining the live stream, we've got uh, Jenny Bouchon from Intuit uh, TurboTax. We're answering all of your questions. So we're actually going to be giving away three copies of TurboTax in just a few minutes here. So if you guys haven't asked a question yet, uh, make sure that you go ahead and do that now because we're going to be picking from everyone who asks a question. Question, and then I'll ask uh, Christian to send me a few names and we'll announce those right at the end in a few minutes here. So no swag today, but we've got even better prizes. We're giving away three copies of uh, TurboTax. So, you know, one question that I think I'm going to ask because this is pretty relevant to me is uh, Jay Crowder again. He asks, uh, he has a website to attract uh, driver referral fees. Can he deduct all of those expenses associated with the website, like hosting or development or things like that? Yes, definitely. Okay, cool. So um, I uh, I do a lot of that too. So that's good to know. <laughs> um, and then you know, as far as you know, with your experience, I mean, are rideshare drivers in general at high? Uh, I guess I would say high risk of being audited because I mean, I know that you know drivers their their gross income might be a little bit higher, but as far as you know, once they're taking all these deductions, right, it doesn't look like they're making a whole lot of money to me at least. Um, are there stats out there that say you know drivers are at high or low risk compared to other people, or what are your thoughts on that? I haven't seen anything specifically for ride sharing, but I think a, a high area for audit is definitely having a home office. Gotcha. Um, so I think that links ties into the mileage and the commuting issue. So I think um, being conservative and not starting your mileage from until you've picked up your first rider is, is, is a safe bet. I think unless you can 100 percent prove your home office, um, it would be risky to deduct starting from starting from home. Gotcha. And then, you know, one thing that I saw that I think I know the answer to, but I see a couple questions coming in is as far as uh, rideshare insurance, because, you know, as you, as you may know, drivers actually have to get personal insurance um, to become a driver, you know, you know, just in general to own a car, but then to, uh, you know, a lot of drivers, we recommend that they go out and get rideshare insurance on top of that. Is that rideshare insurance included if you're taking the standard mileage rate or can you kind of, you know, what can drivers do about that extra cost they're paying for that? Do they just have to eat it? Um, that would be deductible as an actual expense as part of their, yeah. So if that is big enough to take them over the threshold of com when they compare standard to actual, then for that year, they should definitely take actual. Gotcha. Okay. So that makes sense. I mean, it sounds like they can't really take advantage of it um, if they're doing standard mileage, which is kind of a bummer for drivers, right? Because they are paying a little bit of extra money. Uh, maybe we can all as drivers petition the IRS to get that changed. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, cool. Um, well, I guess, uh, I think that seems like about all the questions we have coming in. Um, I'll have Christian go ahead and uh, stay tuned right now. I'll have him go ahead and pick a few winners. Um, so if you guys are picked as a winner, all you need to do is uh, send me a quick email. Um, we are going, we are selecting three winners from everyone who submitted questions ahead of time. And then uh, also from everyone who's asking questions here in the chat. So if you your name is Robert Crawford, uh, Vanessa, who had the massage question, or Jay Crowder, who had the website to attract referral fees. Go ahead and send me an email, harry at the rideshareguy.com, to claim your prize. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining. Let's see if we have any last questions coming in. Uh, Jenny, thank you very much for joining us, too, because that was awesome that you were able to give us all this help. Um, I do see a couple last questions, and then we'll log off here, but um, I think someone was asking as far as CPAs over self-filing I mean what are your thoughts there I mean are there drivers who should be using CPAs or does it make some more sense for one person or another to uh, use CPA or like a TurboTax for example I think if you have a simple situation where you have a W-2 for your primary income and you're driving for Uber or Lyft on the side I think you're you should be perfectly fine using um, using TurboTax um, let's say if you have a separate business, that's your primary business, let's say you're a consultant and you work from home, but you, and then, um, or say like you move during the year and you have potentially two home offices that might get more complicated, um, different things like that, or um, 
let's say you used actual expenses for your car and you traded it in and you have those types of issues can get potentially hairy and I would definitely talk to a CPA. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, I think that's a great question to end on. And we're, if you guys are watching this live, I'll have Christian go ahead and share a link where if you guys are interested, if you didn't win a copy of TurboTax Self-Employed, we'll actually leave a link right now in the chat where you can go ahead and sign up for it if you haven't done your taxes yet. Um, if you have questions about using a CPA, we can definitely help you out there too. And if you have general questions around taxes, we've got a great tax guide. Uh, we've got a couple articles we'll leave links to as far as using. I know I saw a few questions about QuickBooks Self-Employed um, that we didn't get to, so I'll go ahead and leave a link where you can learn more about that. We've actually reviewed the product and uh, TurboTax too, so you can take a look at that. And if you guys are watching um, later on down the road, we'll have all those links right now in the show notes of our YouTube. And definitely check out the blog post that we did over on the Rideshare Guide for this video because we'll have all that information over there in uh, writing too, so you guys can get double uh, information. So Jenny, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, I definitely learned a lot, and I know it looks like all of our readers got a lot out of this too. Uh, Date Doctor says thank you. Um, Alex says congrats. Vanessa says thanks for the great live feed. So definitely a lot of people that appreciate all this information. So thank you for coming on and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. And I just wanted to say for those people who don't currently have some way of tracking it, um, you can try it for free. Intuit's product of the QuickBooks Self-Employed app is definitely free. You can log on and see, is this going to work for me? Um, yeah, definitely give it a try. That's great. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, I know that there's free uh, demos of all those products. And then, I mean, I guess just last question in general for those drivers, if they do have further questions about these things, I mean, they can either get help in these apps, I believe, or you guys have resources on your site too, right? Right. So if you use the online product to actually file your taxes, um, TurboTax this year has something called um, Smart Look. So let's say you're trying to figure out where a deduction goes or have an additional question for ride, ride sharing that you didn't get answered today, you can ask those individuals as well. And for QuickBooks Self-Employed, they also have um, a bunch of great people to support support you. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on and uh, I'll look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you.